then I'll uh, call the um, regular meeting of the Garden City Planning Commission to order. This is Thursday, October 8th, 2020 at 6.30. And to start out, if everyone would join me in uh, saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Quick question, Brian, is there something I can do to lighten me and darken my background? Uh, I had this window wide open last time and, and it looked perfectly normal. I'm not quite sure if there's a option other than just the brightness setting, but I mean, you're, you're not too distorted right now. So. Yeah. Oh, that's worse. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's worse. Let's see where the brightness are here. Okay, less brightness. No, more brightness. Oh, quite ghostly. I guess I'm in keeping with the season then, aren't I? I guess so. Okay, <laughs> before, we, before we do the roll call, I would like to notify the commissioners that Commissioner Kevin Hunt has resigned. Turn that on a effective immediately so who's who's doing that kevin hunt resigned okay so uh with that uh if the secretary would take the roll please chairperson may here commissioner steenberg here commissioner here. turnbull here commissioner walls mr walls here here sorry about that Commissioner Kalitas? Absent and excused. Commissioner Mativier? Absent and excused. Okay, uh, next order of business is approval of the agenda. If uh, someone would like to make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any comments? Hearing none, would you take the roll? Commissioner Walls? Aye. Commissioner Steenberg? Aye. Commissioner Turnbull? Aye. Chairperson May? Aye. Uh, next, uh, approval of minutes from the regular meeting of September 10th, 2020. Again, we need a motion. Motion to approve the minutes from the meeting of September 10th. 2020. Is there support? Support. Okay, motion's made and seconded. Uh, any questions or comments, corrections? Hearing none, would you take the roll? Commissioner Turnbull? Aye. Commissioner Steenberg? Aye. Commissioner Walls? Aye. Chairperson May? Aye. Uh, next item is public comment on non-agenda items only. Uh, do we have any public that uh, wishes to comment? Anyone in the audience? Nope, don't see any hands. Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to the uh, business items. First item, PC 19-008, request for a site plan approval extension to redevelop an existing building for a new restaurant banquet facility at 5651 Middle Belt Road in the CBD, Central Business District. Uh, I assume that their uh, previous uh, approval ran out because of uh, inability to work during uh, COVID? Yes, that's correct, Mr. Chair. The uh, applicant um, has just been trying to juggle everything associated with his other businesses and with trying to get this development up off the ground. 
Um, technically, they were approved on October 9th, so they uh, they needed to at least submit a building permit by that date. So they have requested uh, a one-year extension because they do believe that by next uh, spring they'll be able to come forward with uh, improvements to the uh, building and create their banquet hall. Okay, well, this is something we've been doing fairly regularly with other applicants. So if uh, there any discussion? None. Nope. Someone want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to uh, approve the uh, the extension for the uh, development. Second. Motion made and supported. Any comments or questions? Would the secretary take the roll, please? Commissioner Walls? Aye. Commissioner Turnbull? Aye. Commissioner Steenberg? Aye. Your person may. Aye. Next item, PC 20-006, request for special land use recommendation and site plan approval to establish a hobby shop with an outdoor RC race course at 6332 Middle Belt Road in the C2 Community Business District. And we have a public hearing on this. Uh, for the uh, special land use recommendation. Uh, could we have uh, Mr. Ortega's report, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so tonight we're here with regards to um, what most people might remember as the Maplewood Lumber location, which is at the southeast corner of uh, Middle Belt and Maplewood. Uh, as you may have noticed, the building has been going through some extensive uh, revisions and the applicant has been before you previously uh, in the attempt to rezone the property to a C3 use uh, to achieve his overall development goal for, this, for the site, which would be to develop it for uh, outdoor um, RC racing cars and, um, and an indoor hobby shop and indoor track as well. Um, the, the applicant has at this time chosen to, uh, rather than go with the C3 zoning, go, uh, stay in the C2 zoning, request special use for an open air, uh, um, so you can get you the official name here, the, uh, an open, open air uh, use. Um, so this is a special use uh, under um, the C2 zoning district and uh, it would allow for uh, the uses that he's proposing on the site because the indoor hobby shop is permitted by right on the, in, the, in the C2 and even the indoor track could be uh, construed to be a, uh, another permitted use because of its relationship as accessory to the um, hobby shop. However, the open air business uh, is related to the racetrack uh, that would be located to the east of the existing buildings uh, in what's currently a unimproved uh, vacant yard. Um, so when it comes to special land use, uh, first we have to go over the special use can, can criteria before we consider um, site plan. And I will say that uh, the applicant has had an opportunity to review a letter and he did contact me. He is in the audience tonight and he did contact me indicating that he might want to consider uh, uh, tabling this uh, at some point in the future to answer all the questions. Uh, however, I advised him uh, the opportunity to have uh, the public hearing now would probably be best so that way he could gauge the public's opinions and also the planning commission's opinions. Um, because uh, the first issue with regards to special land use is compatibility. Um, this use is an outdoor activity that involves uh, small RC electric cars being uh, driven on, uh, on a, on a uh, ground or soil uh, racetrack and uh, in a, in, I believe in a competitive setting, uh, you know, between a, other friendly uh, participants. Um, and the applicant has chosen that, as I mentioned, located in this uh, large yard, in the yard, and he is occupying, in the site plan, 
is occupying the large percentage, uh, almost the entire outdoor track. Um, and as proposed on the site plan, he has indicated that right now he would be uh, providing the uh, six foot high masonry wall, which is what we, what is, is our minimum requirements for screening for all commercial uses adjacent to residential zoning districts. Um, to the east of the site is zoned single family residential and it is used single family residential to the south of the site. It's zoned both C2 and R3, which is multifamily. Um, currently to the south of the site facing middle bell is Ramey's and to, and to behind that on central is a one story uh, office building. And then to the north is um, Garden City High and to the west is uh, other commercial properties. So in determining compatibility, what we're supposed to do is take a look at trying to find ways to mitigate any potential negative impacts from, from the special use to adjacent properties. You do that by trying to locate this, the, the use on a portion of the site farthest away from the other uh, uses and also trying to screen it in some way. As I mentioned, the applicant is using the minimum screening of the six foot high wall currently. Um, and because of their desire to have a, uh, I believe their desire to have a track of this size, they're needing to, they've chosen to use the entire site for this outdoor track. Um, so, question. yes. Wouldn't, as a lumber yard, wouldn't that have been a C3 uh, zoning uh, prior? Uh, it's, it's zone C2, uh, looking at the property record, they didn't have any kind of special use approvals or anything to that effect. I believe it's because it was historically always a lumber yard that yes. it, uh, it, um, was legally nonconforming. So it was always, it was always there. And so it's, it probably was established prior to putting lumber yards in C3. And so it was probably, uh, just considered a legally nonconforming use. And once it was vacated for six months, the lumber yard use has to go away. So, yeah, um, okay. the lumber yard was there for as long as I can remember. So, yep. I'm sure it was there before the zoning. Yeah, that lumber was. yard probably built half the houses in this area <laughs> one time. Yep. So, yeah, so it preceded our zoning. And so yeah. that's why the, app, the new property owner has to uh, uh, abide by and, and, and be uh, considered with this process. Okay. So in the end, uh, to conclude with a compatibility issue, uh, you know, there is a minimum level of screening on the site uh, as proposed currently and the chosen location for the outdoor use in the entire outdoor yard and um, some other things that we have yet to hear uh, until the applicant's presentation is the hours of operation. Um, you know, a minimization of the site impacts, you know, can't be really assured based on what's proposed for us. So can I believe there are other opportunities to ensure compatibility, but as presented, it's not really uh, taking advantage of that. Other, the other big thing that we look at is compatibility with the master plan. Um, as mentioned on the table on page two, excuse me, uh, in the paragraph on page three, uh, the site is zoned, uh, front of it is zoned for uh, central businesses to track to actually, and to the rear of the site and, and uh, to the property of the south is, is zoned, excuse me, future land use of flexible residential. Because this portion of the city is the idea is, is utilizing what's um, a, a type of land use approach called transitional land use planning in which we start with the higher density and active, active uses closer to the main roads, put some lesser intense, but still compatible uh, adjacent to those and then use that as a buffer, acts as a buffer to our single family residents, in this case, to the east. Um, so and for that reason, it's, it's proposed as flexible residential, excuse me, it's planned as flexible residential. And um, by utilizing uh, the site for complete commercial uh, without any kind of buffering, uh, then we're looking at um, having these higher intensity uses directly adjacent to residential. And currently that's not uh, this, this um, the, the actual hobby shop and the indoor track would be compatible, the goals of the master plan of having commercial along uh, middle belt. However, uh, allowing this int intensive outdoor commercial use directly adjacent to single family isn't really um, keeping with this idea of a transition between the commercial and residential uses. 
question on that point. Yes. Um, how would you compare that then to the putt putt golf course on Ford Road that abuts an R1, a total R1 district, not a not an R2? Right. Yeah, that one um, is once again a legacy use. Um, I don't believe that. I don't have the master plan in front of me. I can look, look take a look at it, but I believe the master plan doesn't have the opportunity on that. Um, but keep behind the businesses on Ford Road to offer a transition um, because of the lesser lot depth. Um, but that doesn't mean there's other ways that can transition, even for this site. Even for this site, if they had more screening, then that's a possibility of allowing um, a transition. Um, it's just that right now, as, as proposed with us, it's uh, going to be directly up against the single family residential. Um, but that is doesn't, something to look at because there are definitely other, I'm sorry, Fred, go ahead. I was just going to say, doesn't uh, section of the zoning ordinance uh, in C2 also require a buffer between higher intensity uses and residential? Uh, yeah, that's why we, we have our des designation of certain uses in the C2 and those that are more intense being in C3 because they're larger lots and they have the ability to be usually either not against uh, single family residential or have the ability to put a buffer on their site, even on their own site between themselves and the single family residential. Um, so there's that. Uh, Do we know other what the considerations. distance? Oh, excuse me. No, no, go ahead. Do we know what the distance is between that first R1 and the and uh, Ford Road there? Isn't that some three to 350 feet away from Ford Road to the east? I believe at least, at least probably if not more, just because the site, itself, the site itself is actually pretty deep. Um, I can get that for you in a moment. But um, yeah, that's coupled definitely enough. with the fact that there's a two story building that forms a block between that first house, which is some 300 plus feet away. I can't see this outdoor RV thing being any sort of a noise issue whatsoever. Traffic on Ford Road is going to make three times, if well, not middle, noise, middle I mean on uh, Middle well, Belt. Middle Belt, not on Ford Road. Hey, right. Middle Belt, excuse me. And we, we also have the, the proposed track directly adjacent to the residential property behind it. It's not 300 feet away. No, it's, it's budding up too with a curtain wall, a six foot curtain wall, which is all that's the minimum. That's the minimum requirement. Right. Uh, currently the property line of the single family home is about 460 feet from the middle belt right away. And then it's about, uh, uh, 200 feet from the property line to the rear of the or the west east elevation of the existing buildings. So the, the outdoor area in which the track is proposed is about 200 feet uh, in width along Maplewood and it is would be directly adjacent to the single family home. Uh, How about the uh, uh, multiple family directly behind it? What type yeah, of distance are you showing for that? It, well the the building itself is pretty much directly adjacent. It is about, it's only about 10, 15 feet from the property line that it shares with the um, outdoor track and where the, uh, the um, screening wall would be. That's oh. uh, currently used as an office planned uh, and, and zoned as multifamily currently. Okay. So the, the main noise abatement concern would be between the multiple family in the rear of the property line or the easternmost edge of the property line if he wanted to make the track go all the way to that line. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Both the multiple family and the single family residential. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's currently used as an office. It's planned for, for multifamily residential. Uh, and then to the south of the track and to the east of the track, it's single family and then it's more of the neighborhood. Okay. Um, 
the other issue, main issue with regards to special use is there are some specific special use requirements for uh, open air businesses. Uh, the first being minimal lot area, which he meets easily. Uh, the second is a driveway location. Uh, the driveways are supposed to be located at least 60 feet from the street or road intersection right of ways. Uh, and in this particular case, the one of the driveways that is currently exists along Maplewood is located approximately 37 feet from Middle Belt. Uh, so in order to comply with this, the that that uh, driveway would have to be um, curbed and removed and uh, a green belt installed that uh, in that location. Um, and as we get when we get to the site plan in a second, uh, you'll see that he that one of the options does comply with that. Um, however, one other requirement of open air businesses, they provide a 10 foot landscape buffer between any road right away. Um, and the sheet C2 of the site plan does show parking directly adjacent to the road right away. So the applicant would have to provide a rise, revised site plan providing that 10 foot landscape buffer uh, along Middle Belt and Maplewood. Uh, for that matter. He also meets the minimum lot width and, uh, and, and loading requirements. So the only two issues specific to open air businesses are the uh, 10 foot landscape buffer and removal of the driveway. Um, and then a the majority of the basic other issues do revolve around the location of the, of the proposed use and uh, some additional information that would probably be um, very indicative of, of what how compatible the site could be. For example, when it comes to the use of adjacent property, uh, the condition of approval is supposed to be that the special use shall not interfere with the use and enjoyment of adjacent property. Um, I think if the uh, hours of operation will be known in a moment and then uh, things such as lighting and noise of the outdoor track, um, the potential for that to impact the neighbors could or couldn't uh, depend on uh, the proposal, for example, there's no, currently there's no proposed outdoor lighting. And if that's the case, and if the applicant is not using the outdoor track in the, in the nighttime hours or without any uh, uh, extensive lighting, uh, a lighting of the track through the nighttime hours, that could be the ability to make it um, a J, uh, compatible. However, if the intent is to operate it uh, for an extended amount of time, then the amount, and then it could severely, it could severely impact the use and enjoyment of adjacent property. Um, and then things such as impact on traffic, you know, the, the use has, will have no impact on the adjacent traffic. Public services, one issue might be is if when it comes to the tracks themselves, um, there was no indication as to what type of grade change the tracks would be. If the cars are smaller little cars and his grade change is only two feet, then I could see that not being very impactful. But if if the cars are intended to have these larger ramps and uh, you know six eight feet change in grade elevation, then you're talking about an extensive uh, stormwater uh, mitigation efforts because there would be a lot of ponding and a lot of uh, sheet flow, and that would be require extensive uh, engineering review to make to ensure that the uh, any kind of change in grade doesn't impact stormwater. Um, but that all depends on any kind of revised submittal in which it states how steep the grades would be on the track. So once again, if they're little, it'd be very minimal to no impact. If they're larger, could have substantial impact. Um, so that's those are the main issues with regards to the special use. Uh, moving on to site plan. Um, well, I, Mr. Chair, I don't know if you want to stop and have the public hearing on special use items or if you want to go into the site plan issues. Uh, well, yeah, since the public hearing is for the special use, why don't we stop here and uh, is the applicant available? Yes, he's raising his hand. If he'd like to make a statement concerning the uh, application. Well, we get him on the screen. Yep, he's coming. Good to be Larry. Okay. All right. Oh, Mr. Candy, you're muted right now. You want to turn your mic on? There you go. Uh, if you'd like to make a statement concerning your application, go ahead. He still appears mu muted on my end. Uh, not getting anything.
Uh, can you contact him? Yeah, let me try to get a hold. I beg your pardon. I had to dial back in to be able to speak to y'all. Oh, well, good. I'm glad you're here now. Thank you. Um, regarding the special use, if I might, I wanted to point out that uh, I was the original creator of the business that became Pandemonium Games in Garden City. Uh, that business that I created became nationally known as a first-rate gaming center. Uh, Pandemonium, in the, uh, subsequently, has become known globally as a premier gaming center. Uh, the new owner, or I should say new, it's been almost 20 years, has done an excellent job in promoting and creating a good environment. Uh, there is an entire generation of individuals from surrounding states who know Garden City to be cool or a hip place for having such a venue. In my opinion, Garden City lacks these interesting venues. It prevents Garden City from becoming a destination and to a certain extent relegates the city to no more than a crossroads from Livonia to the airport or from Canton to Ford Motor Company. To promote local business as well as the reputation of the city, it's my opinion that more creative and unique venues such as the one I'm proposing are needed here. Uh, that being the case, uh, there are, you know, some points that I would love to make uh, in as far as uh, the actual application things, but I think that that's perhaps for later in the meeting. Okay. Well, we'll have more discussion uh, later if you'd, if you'd care to wait till then. Be my pleasure. Oh, very good. Uh, do we have any other uh, public comments or discussion? Do you want to officially open the public hearing then at this I'm, point? I'm officially opening the public hearing now. Okay. Uh, let's bring in Kim Dold has her hand here. Let me get her on screen. All right. Kim, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you okay. Hear you? Okay. Um, okay, go ahead, Kim. We, are, we have a new chairperson for the DEA. Uh, Jeff, are you with me? I can't hear. Oh. Can't no, hear. I can't hear you either. You need to uh, speak closer or louder. Well, I can do louder, that's for sure. Is that better? <laughs> well, having right now, I can't hear you very well. Can't hear you. Okay, well, I'm not sure why. Uh, are you on a laptop? Yes. Okay, just uh, try to be as close to where your, your microphone is. Where's my microphone at? Up here? Oh, right here? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, you, you're, you kind of go in and out, but right now I can hear you. Okay. That's good. Wait a minute. Is that better? No. Yeah. Yeah, you're Do good. Do a test. Do a test. Do a five, four, three, two, one. On the keyboard? No. no. Uh, verbally. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> you start off strong. Okay, the first couple it? of words that you guys are saying, we can hear. And then it's like it trails off to, to nothing. Like you're a hundred miles away. Like you're moving away from the microphone. Um, that. One second. And it's all the way up automatically adjust volume. No, there's a test mic. Can you hear anything now? 
Yeah, you're, you're, you're very good. good. So go ahead. Okay. Oh. <laughs> now it's going to echo on me. Um, I said it real quick. I just wanted to let everyone know that the DDA has a new chairperson, John Fleming, and he's here with me tonight. Okay. Okay. But we, we just wanted to um, very quickly state that this project does have the DDA's uh, endorsement behind it. We do feel that it's going to be an economic benefit to Garden City. There is nothing like this in our surrounding communities. And um, we, we also, you know, because it's, uh, it's a safe, family-oriented place, it's a walkable location for our kids downtown and for our families, if that was the case. So just kind of really wanted to put that out there, that uh, it does have the DDA's approval, and we'll sit here and listen to the rest of the meeting. Okay, well, thanks for your comments. And of course, uh, as, uh, I talked to uh, uh, Lily and I, uh, we had a meeting today, and uh, part of it is I've been here for 45 years, and, and number one, that building is an eyesore, no offense for that, but that building is an eyesore. <laughs> we, have... we got to do better than this. We're, we're losing I've heard about that. four words. Yeah. We didn't get any of the last part of that. I think you might be better. Really need to look at making. It, yeah, it says our connection is unstable. Yeah, it looks like we're not going to really be able to communicate, so we'll go on with the meeting. You know, we can't hear anything you're saying right now. Um, okay. Brian, would it be possible for them to call back on the telephone to? Uh, yeah, they yeah if they want to do that, so um, they can dial have, back in. And we don't have video in. anyway. Starting uh, to Kim, resemble. Why don't you do that? Call. Can you call uh, back in on the phone rather than uh, on the computer? Yes, we'll do that. Okay. Good. Uh, well, moving on, Brian, is there any other uh, people that want to speak? I don't see any hands right now. Let's see if there's... Okay. Uh, was there any uh, written comments that uh, were received on this application? No, nope, our office uh, did not receive any written communications. Okay. Uh, we'll uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes, give them a chance to uh, call in. In the meantime, uh, you know, there's there's definitely some issues that I see with the. Uh, special land use application and uh, the biggest problem is the negative impact on the residential district behind it. The, uh, there's, there's no buffer as it's presented. Uh, there's some other minor things, but another major problem is a uh, lack of uh, parking, which I believe will address further in the uh, site plan. Uh, Fred? Yes. It looks like they're dialing back in here. So I'm gonna... Okay, if you'll put them on. Yep. Uh, she's muted. I got them off. Take them off mute there. Okay, Hello. can you hear us now? Okay. Can okay. Uh, go ahead, Kim. You okay to hear now? I can hear you. Yeah, just uh, you know, what a really, we need so much echo. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, our meeting earlier today, uh, I think there's some things to be done. Uh, 
Kim, are you standing near your computer? We seem to be getting feedback on the phone. Go over there. <laughs> Turn your computer off. Okay. Go in, go in the back of the office. This is going to make it to Saturday Night Live, I'm sure of it. Kim, can you hear us now? We can hear you guys. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, I hear you, but you you it's come still in and go out. John's so. on his phone. John dialed in on his phone, and he's talking on the phone, but you're not hearing him. So what what phone number is he? What's the is he using? He dialed in on the three one two six two six number. Because I'm not seeing that one in the audience. Oh no no no! His number is seven three four six zero four. Okay, so yep, so let me let him let me activate his ability to speak through the phone there. Okay. Yep. Okay, now he should be able. Okay, who is who is this again? John, they're asking who you are. Can you can you hear me on the phone? Oh, yes, I can hear you guys now. Okay, good. Who am I speaking yep. to? This is John Fleming. Okay. You want to go ahead and make your comments? Yeah, just that uh, we, uh, I just wanted to reiterate what Jim said. The VDA is a full backing uh, of this project, uh, and I'm sure there's things that can be done to, to get this site plan approved uh, with some, obviously, some uh, modifications. So, I just want to make sure you understand or the committee understands we have full backing. So that, I won't take up any more of your time. Oh, okay, well, thank, thank you. you. Do we have anybody else, Brian? I don't see any other hands. If there's, if there's no one else, then I'm going to close the public hearing at, uh, uh, let's see, it's 7.09. Wait, I got one more hand up now. Okay. So let's go to Randy. Hello, Randy. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. I just want to let you guys know that I'm uh, listening to the meeting, but I will be leaving. Uh, I'm a guest on Garden City uh, Community Chat tonight. I'll be leaving at eight o'clock, but I am uh, here as a liaison for the Planning Commission tonight. And thanks for all you guys do. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Mayor. Anyone else, Brian? Uh, let's see. No other hands right now. I'm uh, not seeing any other hands for. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, close the public hearing at 710. Um, now move on to uh, planning commission uh, discussion and recommendations. Do I have any uh, one who has a comment? or wishes to uh, ask a question? Fred, I think that there's a, a, a big concern about the noise transmittal to the, the properties to the east, which are going to be basically adjacent to the track. And uh, I think that we really need to look at what the operating hours are going to be. Is there going to be lighting? Exterior lighting, uh, is it going to be covered? I, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions. If this is going to be a 365 a year uh, operation, we do have winters here in Michigan. So 
I'm just wondering uh, is, is uh, some of these some of these questions need to be answered, need to be addressed, especially for the people well, there. Mr. Um, if I if I might, I actually have a number of these issues answered. Uh -huh. um, if you'd care, if if you would be willing, I'd be more than happy to give you. Uh, some responses on some of the issues that I read in the uh, <clears throat> review. Would that be appropriate then? That, that might answer a number of questions for everyone. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So, so uh, first and foremost, uh, in my original use statement, I stated that there was going to be no outside lighting whatsoever other than what would be necessary to secure you know, the facility. Right now there are lights on the outside of the warehouse area just to illuminate, uh, you know, the general vicinity uh, and to make sure that it's secure. Other than that, there is no uh, intention of having any nighttime events or anything beyond dusk whatsoever. And as far as the hours are concerned, uh, <clears throat> we're, this would be obviously limited by daylight hours, uh, but quite honestly, normal business hours for any sort of outdoor activity. If there's an ordinance uh, in Garden City, we're happy to follow the ordinance, but most likely I can't ever imagine anything going beyond 7 or 8 p.m. in the evening. Uh, so the issue of lighting and uh, in as far as the hours are concerned, there is no intention of uh, being disruptive to the area. It's simply uh, to provide uh, outdoor, uh, an outdoor area during daylight hours. Uh, the, the other big issue that I would like to address, and you have to forgive me because I have a, a document that has all this detailed, but I'm gonna go out of order just so I can answer some questions, that uh, we did uh, some decibel rating testing in that area uh, adjacent to the property. And we sampled morning, afternoon, and evening uh, decibel levels. We found the average decibel level near the single residence that is to the east of us to be an average of 56.5 decibels, okay? We then uh, ran four models, uh, including one nitro or gasoline powered, which we don't intend to allow and with even the gasoline powered unit, our peak decibel level was absorbed, uh, observed to be 66.5 decibels. And uh, you know, on average 66.5 decibels is considered to be an average office uh, noise level. Um, these are not very loud uh, devices. We don't plan on having loud speakers and things of that sort blasting uh, day and night. Uh, that uh, is is not compatible with my vision of what we're going to have here. Um, Are you planning on having uh, spectators at this track? Uh, there, I'm, I, like any other event, I'm sure there will be some spectators, uh, you know, parents or siblings, things of that sort. It, you know, uh, will, uh, is it possible that spectators would come from further away to observe a larger uh, event, it's possible, uh, but I don't believe that you, you're not going to end up with a hundred people there. That's, that's not going to happen, uh, simply not gonna happen. You might have one spectator for every five or 10 participants. And quite honestly, the average participant level is going to be less than 20. So again, you may have four or five observers for a particular event. Will you be having 20 cars running at the same time? Is that what you mean? Negative. Uh, the track can accommodate between four and six cars at a time. Okay. And you said you're not going to allow uh, the gasoline powered cars? That is correct. Yeah, that's been stated from, from the beginning. Okay. That, that, that is far too disruptive. There, there are exhaust issues and there can be noise issues beyond that. And quite honestly, uh, there are other issues that I, I don't want to even begin to deal with when it comes to any sort of fuel uh, being used anywhere near uh, an urban area. Yeah, that uh, does present some other risks, that's for sure. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. This is, you know, predominantly these are this type of venue is is utilized by, you know, uh, families, father and son, brother, sister, whatever the case may be. It's it. They're generally uh, a, a nice, very clean alternative uh, hobby uh, to the digital age, so to speak. It's something mechanical that people can actually participate in together. And that's the idea. And that's what we're trying to promote. Uh, the last thing that I'm looking for is anything nefarious in any way, shape or form that defeats the, the purpose. And quite honestly, this type of hobby has never been considered nefarious. Michigan has always had a, uh, uh, a strong uh, tie to anything radio control operated. We're actually uh, I think number five, if I'm not mistaken, in the country for anything radio control operated and as far as the number of participants. Uh, and that's pretty impressive seeing as how there are a number of warm weather states that are that have larger populations than we do. Uh, and I think the reason for that is so many people growing up in a, in a technical manufacturing environment. Uh, you know, fathers that work for auto companies or engineers or other technical uh, uh, jobs and uh, kids being basically attracted to that type of thing. I know that's basically what attracted me to it is the technical aspect of it and the mechanical aspect of it. Uh, kids like to tinker, and this gives them something nice and safe and fun to tinker with. And uh, it's uh, beyond that, again, nothing nefarious. Um, the, I did want to address, uh, the driveway. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, we did offer one, uh, site plan that showed closing of that initial driveway on Maplewood. And because it is, uh, really useless and actually, in my opinion, dangerous, uh, to have it that close from middle belt. So it was our intention to close that. And, uh, it will obviously show that the other point that I wanted to bring up was the distance of our parking lot from actual roadway um, to the west from middle belt to the sidewalk is 24 feet. So there is an entire green easement there prior to the sidewalk uh, like again, of 24 feet. Now, to put an additional 10 feet of landscape on the middle belt side or the west side would put us uh, 34 feet plus the width of a sidewalk away from uh, a roadway. And I think that that becomes a little bit, uh, a little bit overdone. Uh, if we consider, for example, the, uh, the mall that is uh, in downtown Garden City, the larger strip there, it looks like the green beltway that is adjacent to the sidewalk uh, from, from what we could measure was five feet. Uh, and I, I can understand having another five feet into the parking lot beyond the sidewalk. That might make sense. But going 38 feet from the street seems a bit excessive. On the Maplewood side, the distance from Maplewood, from the curb of Maplewood to our actual parking area is 18 feet. Uh, so w the parking lot is not, you know, a, a budding uh, roadway or that close to a roadway to begin with. So I, I would appreciate a discussion and consideration on uh, perhaps that those distances as well for for the uh, green belt. Uh, the uh, one other point that I'd like to make is there was con concern about the grade on a uh, racetrack with the scale of vehicles that we're talking about, the average change in grade would be uh, less than a foot and the absolute maximum would be three feet. Now we're talking about models that are six inches tall or eight inches tall. Uh, I'm not even quite sure that what they would do with six or eight feet of grade change, uh, it, would, it wouldn't work. So uh, to alleviate uh, any fears of that sort, we are only talking about one to three feet maximum with the majority of that track not changing grade whatsoever. This is in very select places around the track. Um, so the last issue that I wanted to address was, and this is a primary concern for me with the review, was the uh, McKenna analysis of the parking requirements. 
So if we look at other open air business models as defined in the ordinance, we find that there's special consideration given to certain outdoor uses that have areas that are not intended to be occupied with patrons. Uh, this would be like tennis courts and archery courts, miniature golf courses, for example. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Um, a, a typical 18 hole miniature golf course would require 56 spots. Uh, our own Garden City Mini Golf, which measures approximately 95 by 240 feet, would require 114 spots versus 56 spots. Uh, another example would be archery, for example, a, a 200 square foot require, uh, a 200 square foot requirement would require 147 spaces for 10 archery ranges that would only accommodate 20 patrons at full load. So the actual course that we're discussing is approximately 26,600 square feet. And this area is not accessible for patrons to occupy. It is not intended for any people to occupy whatsoever. So in, since there is a limited number of vehicles that uh, the track can uh, accommodate at any moment in time, um, that dictates the size of the course. Uh, the area that is intended to be occupied by patrons and or spectators is approximately 4,500 square feet. So if we so, apply, uh, you know, the same outdoor calculation, that would require 23 spots. Uh, the largest events might have 20 to 30 participants, right? With only eight being able to use the outdoor area at any moment in time. So it, I think that some sort of consideration and uh, uh, really rethought on the parking requirements would be appropriate here. Well, we can certainly look at the uh, usage uh, of the site in developing the parking. Uh, was, there, was there anything else you wanted to point out at this time? Well, one, one last thing, uh, in, the, in the review, uh, McKenna mentions that, uh, you know, uh, compatibility with the master plan, right? But the property, uh, the residence that's to the east was originally taken from this property. Uh, anybody who's lived here long enough knows the story that it was uh, the owners who actually cut that piece off and built the house, right? And the person who has purchased that commercial property, right, is, is fully aware that they've purchased uh, a property adjacent to commercial. Additionally, they are across the street from one of the largest, the loudest venues in Garden City, which is Garden City High School. Uh, the average decibel rating of marching band is over 100 decibels, and there is constant activity under normal circumstances, normal times, at that high school year round, literally. We have football games, baseball games, practice, marching band, parents in and out, cars driving back and forth on a regular basis. Uh, it, that high school is, is entirely more disruptive than any sort of outdoor venue that we could possibly propose in our limited area. Uh, the final thing that, the final point that I'd like to make is that it was pointed out that there is an alternative track that is in Plymouth which is uh, about nine miles from here. And that the, there's not a need for this type of venue in Garden City uh, because this venue is 9.2 miles away. That, that particular site is not maintained. It's in poor repair. I actually was there yesterday taking a look and it's, it's even gone worse since the last time I'd seen it. And uh, with some discussions that I had with Wayne County Parks, last summer, they're considering dismantling that, that location because it's not sponsored, it's not being cared for. But quite honestly, with the logic of because something is nine miles from here, there's no need for it in Garden City, you could extrapolate that and say that there's really no need for any new business in Garden City because I'm sure within nine miles, we can find any venue that or, or business that a Garden City resident could possibly want. The, the concept here is to create something unique to draw people to Garden City, uh, not to take garden, our Garden City residents and move them to Plymouth to go for activity. That doesn't make any sense. 
So I, uh, I apologize for the length of time, but I, I wanted to make some of these points clear if I could. Okay, I appreciate your comments. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at some of these things. Uh, my, my biggest issue with the special land use is possibility of having a negative impact on the adjacent residential property. Now, if we can mitigate that so that's not an issue, then maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe we have some ideas about what we could do. I think, I think possibly one thing that uh, would help is if we made the, uh, the screening wall in the back taller, I think maybe an eight foot wall instead of a, uh, a six foot wall would be better. Uh, if there are no lights to be, if the track is not to be lighted, then that's also a uh, benefit. I also, I'm not crazy about the idea of the um, chain link fencing along the Maplewood side either. I, I think uh, for the track area, I think a, uh, a fence that's uh, maybe a privacy fence that's not something you can see through and chain link is not very attractive anyway. So we, we need to come up with a different alternative to that in, in my opinion. <clears throat> As far as the parking lot being set back 10 feet from the street, that's a that's a requirement. You you say your parking lot is not that close. Well, maybe we need to uh, get more detailed uh, plans so we can take a look at that. The uh, Certainly, the uh, the driveway closer to Middle Belt needs to be closed down because that's a that's too close to Middle Belt and it presents a danger, in my opinion. Commissioner, if I might uh, offer a comment, please. Um, yes. <clears throat> one of my concerns um, with the residents, and quite honestly, you know, I, I'm not sure if it's known or not, but I actually uh, constructed the privacy fence that exists to the east of my property, I paid for because the, the rear portion of that property was horrible looking and uh, we needed to uh, place that uh, fence on the property line as well, which it wasn't originally. Uh, but if you consider that <clears throat> the alternative to using this as an outdoor space would be uh, my constructing another metal building uh, in that area with a, with a dirt floor fully enclosed. Uh, and I think Mr. Ortega can probably tell us what the uh, offset from the residential property line would be required to be, but then we would be talking about a 14 to 18 foot tall metal structure that would be in the backyard of that residence, which I think would be uglier than you know, uh, quite honestly, having a, a, a six foot or eight foot tall masonry fence uh, there, a masonry wall there for that matter. Uh, and Mr. Ortega, do you, would you happen to know what the offset for such a construction would be by any chance? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I'll look it up right now. Okay, and uh, we might see if there's any restriction on the amount of lot coverage for with buildings like that. Does anyone else have a uh, comment about the uh, special land use application? Hey, uh, Fred, I don't, uh, me personally, I think I would like to see something like this go through. Um, so is, is our big concern here as a group, is it just basically the, the, the noise that's going to happen? I know there's some small issues with the fence and whatnot, but that's really the only issue. And it seems like he's kind of covered that with not that's, using the gas power. You know, that's the primary issue in my view, but we also have a parking issue that is going to come up in the uh, in the site yeah. plan too. I'm looking at that. It looks like he has quite a few spots and he is kind of right about 
we have to keep in mind with something like this, it's obviously a large space, but the, the kind of venue it is, is it going to attract large groups of people, I, I would think. Um, um, if I may, uh, to answer, answer some of the parking issues. Well, actually, if I'll go back and answer uh, the issues with regards to the setback, it looks like it would be actually, I thought there was additional setback between commercial and residential, but uh, it doesn't look like it. So if it was 18, fall, 18 feet high, it would be considered a two-story building and it would be eight feet rear yard setback from the, from the line. So we'd only have to be eight feet provided, um, yeah, just eight feet. Well, if oh, I was that God. resident, I sure wouldn't want to look at that. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of um, lot coverage, technically, we don't have lot coverage requirements. Uh, it's about the, rely on a, a combination of uh, the square footage the applicant or the business would need versus the need to fit in the appropriate parking. So to address the parking issue, um, uh, I do would agree that um, the, opt oh, the open air business, that standard of one parking space for every what is it, 300 or 100 feet, whatever it is, that's pretty uh, stringent. And so there have been instances in which it is based on the um, amount of area that's utilized by the, uh, by the uh, participants. So I could see that uh, as being uh, a modification because I included on page six, in that table with regards to open air businesses, the strict compliance is one parking space per 200 square feet of land area. Uh, and his outdoor land area is 31,000 uh, square feet. However, because it's not fully utilized by people, you know, it'd be different if it was like even a used car lot where people are walking I was around. Say though, it's, it's not the same as if he was having a flea market there. Correct. Where, where we have, it's tables and people everywhere. Uh, right, he mentioned that they're, yeah, they're well, going to be restricted to but, only 4,500 square feet. So to me, that makes sense. And the ordinance does allow it because it's going through special use to, uh, as long as the applicant uh, is, is uh, agreeable to that um, square footage requirement, that would adjust the parking requirement. I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, two things. Uh, yeah, I'm with you on that, Fred, because I think normally aren't we applying these parking numbers and these equations to a retail space that would be filled with retail. Um, it's sort of what I envision here or what I'm looking at, we have a retail setting where a big portion of property is not involved in the retail. So I think we need to adjust our parking numbers accordingly and also, if he closes off that driveway, isn't he going to pick up a number of uh, spots right, right there? Well, probably a couple anyway. He'll pick yeah, up a, a few. Couple, two, three. Uh, He'll pick up a I few, mean, but um, Fred, I think you already mentioned it, but with regards to the 10-foot uh, requirement, that's a specific requirement for open-air businesses. So that's why it's larger than our normal commercial businesses, where we usually are trying to have at least a three to five foot uh, landscape buffer. And it's supposed to be measured from the right-of-way line. Uh, so it's measured on the private property side of the right-of-way line. So the right-of-way line on Middle Belt right and on Maple. Where the sidewalk would be or where the road is? Where the, or the, the sidewalk is inside the, the public right-of-way. So the official property lot line begins you know, at the sidewalk, at the inner line of the sidewalk. Um, so that's where the property Which in this is. case, the east side of the sidewalk adjacent to his parking lot. Correct. Well, so that but if I might comment way. though, sure. the, the, <clears throat> the parking area uh, is adjacent to the buildings that are used for retail. There, there really is no parking in the open air section of the, of this business. Uh, so you can see it's a little bit confusing and it's to a certain extent dual use, correct? Because the only open air area really is the back portion. So the front portion is effectively standard retail and whatever the requirements would be there would make sense. Um, and if it needs to be set back from the right away, understandable, but I think in my opinion, and again, it's the, the board's ultimate decision. I think 10 feet is excessive. Um, 
Fred, um, if, if noise is one of our concerns, and of course it is because we have put in R1, I'm thinking of it as, a, as a, the resident of that first property. I would not want to look at an 18 foot tall metal building, definitely. Well, uh, even with the 18 foot building, he still would have to have a screening wall. Right. I'm thinking that if we stuck with the six foot screening wall, which doesn't look objectionable on the residential side, I don't think, because we have a, quite a few of them in the city as examples. If he were to do that and put up, I'm not sure the correct name, I think they call them uh, wandering ewes, those uh, uh, bushes, they're evergreens, they're, they're tall and skinny. Yeah, the arborvitas. Is that what they yeah. yeah. If he was to put those inside a six foot uh, masonry wall, that seems like it would uh, do a tremendous amount for screening from middle belt as well as the activities when they're when they're uh, going on. Right. I mean, that's the other thing I was saying in terms of the screening requirement of capability. Uh, there's other alternatives. Landscape, I think, alternatives would would go a lot towards. Um, mitigating any kind of noise. Uh, yeah, the, they, can, they can do that, uh, right? To help mitigate noise. Help absorb the, uh, the noise a little bit, but I think, you know, in view of the, the situation, I think the minimum six foot wall is not adequate. I think if we considered it, that we should look at an eight foot masonry wall between the residential area and the back and then along the side on middle belt on maplewood i believe that should be similar to a privacy fence something opaque that you can't see through rather than chain link fence because i don't think that's very attractive at all yeah, if i might sure comment on official. that uh, yes commissioner may just to comment to you um you know, along Maplewood, uh, originally I had considered erecting a six foot tall white vinyl fence. Uh, and I was obviously told that I couldn't do that, but that it needed to be either a chain link uh, or a masonry fence. But to erect a masonry fence that distance along Maplewood, honestly, it almost looks like a prison wall. And, I, and I, I, I think that's aesthetically horrible. I mean, I'd love to find an alternative, uh, believe me, and I would like to have it closed off. That was my original plan. But again, if I can't use a vinyl fence, I'm not sure what the, al excuse me, the alternative would be. Okay, can you wait a minute? Uh, Mr. Ortega, is there some reason he couldn't put a, uh, uh, either vinyl or uh, maybe a Trex type material fence along that? As I was going to say, there's a lot of different fencing alternatives, and because the under a straight fence permit, he wouldn't be allowed to put in those other materials. But as as wrapped up in a special use requirement, because if you approve and require it, then he could install whatever type of fencing material we're thinking of. I mean, there's lots of different types of materials that the tracks I'm, would work. I'm a, I'm a little bit leery to approve a vinyl fence because they don't last real long. I think something a little more durable would be better in the, the same uh, fashion. There are a lot of uh, precast or even masonry that are uh, not concrete masonry unit, not, not cinder block, but you're talking about uh, um, pile, uh, pillars that are uh, masonry and then they have uh, um, precast sheet panels that drop in between the pillars and they yeah, are sturdy. Those, I was thinking more along the line of a, a regular privacy fence only right. make, instead of using vinyl material, using uh, something like Trex, which we've discussed in some other applications. Yeah, and that's, a, that's another option too. Uh, they're all in different materials and colors and styles that would be pretty attractive. They can be very attractive. And usually, um, especially with Trex, it can be a cost-effective uh, option. But uh, I think that in combination with landscaping would buffer the uh, sound of the, of the, depending on it, um, I, those alternatives. Yeah. I agree. Um, I agree. Does, the, does the 
fence have to extend all the way down the Maplewood side or just where the track is? It would be up to you. I would think possibly the track would be enough. Um, you, I don't know if you really need to fence in the uh, parking lot, um, but I would think just if I might, feet of the, tra of the fence might work. If I might make a comment though, is yes. for the purposes of aesthetics, it would be nice to have, and, I, and Trex is another consideration. It's, a, it's actually a very good consideration, but it, quite honestly, it would, be, it would be more appealing for the homeowner. And again, I've, try, I've really tried to be conscientious of this single residence home <clears throat> to the extent where that if it were a little less expensive, I'd have bought it myself. That way I would have been the one protesting, but um, neither here nor there. I think for aesthetics, because the fence along the north-south border with the residents has to extend into their front lawn, right? To keep that aesthetically pleasing, I think it would be a, a wonderful idea to use the same material in the east as well as uh, on the, the east-west run or along Maplewood, just so that the homeowner doesn't have, you know, masonry in one section and then trucks running the other way and it just kind of looks hodgepodge. I agree. Definitely. I, uh, Fred. I really think we need masonry along that east border, uh, the, the part along uh, Maplewood's not going to extend in front of the homeowner's property. It's only, it's gonna end at your property. Right, but the masonry wall that runs north-south is going to be across the edge of their front lawn. And that was my consideration is it would be more pleasant, more aesthetically pleasing again, uh, to have the, the entire fence, the same material, whatever material that is, that's approved. Uh, to Fred. Mike. Mike. Um, yeah, I'm trying to picture this from the, the residents sitting in their front yard or their driveway or whatnot. I think to have that fence be all one down the east, west, and the north, south would not only look more pleasing from the Maplewood side, it, it looked more pleasing from the residential side. And so far as going over six feet, if we thought we needed more abatement, I would like to do it with greenery because quite frankly, going higher than six feet, it starts to look like a, a, a a prison wall and also I think there's I think there's something about that six foot number uh, that has to do with uh, public safety um, I think that six foot mark is if if a uh, policeman needs to see over the wall for some reason mm -hmm. somebody's running from them or somebody's uh, in your backyard that they can get a view over that fence possibly. Um, so I think there's some kind of public safety aspect to that six foot marker. But if we need to go any higher than that, I, I would definitely like to, to see it with the uh, Arbor Vitae or something similar um, rather than have a concrete eight foot wall there because that does start to look too much like a, a prison in, in enclosure to me. I like that idea of the Arborvitaes too. It uh, it absorbs a lot of sound and it'll look good. I agree. Yeah, and I, I don't think there's much maintenance to those either, is there? Well, no. the trouble is the Arborvitae don't always live that long. They have a tendency to die off, turn brown, and then you're left with a bunch of brown bushes. Well, that's if he doesn't take care of them. Well, we could write that into the uh, special use uh, that they be maintained. Uh, Till they, till nature takes over and makes them permanently green, because they are an evergreen, if I'm not mistaken. There are a lot of different species that would work, and actually, there's some tall, the ones that would grow tall too. I think that would be something that would be effective. Uh, and the good thing is, they could be planted um, a certain distance on center. Whatever our landscape architect would recommend, a certain distance on center. That uh, eventually, in I believe it's a three-year period that they would eventually 
meet a requirement of creating a cohesive um, screening wall. It would that's fill in. Huh? Opaque. Yeah, it would fill in basically. Yeah, much better word. Oh. It would fill in, and then and then they. But you know, he doesn't have to buy six foot tall trees right now. He could buy leaves, you know. shrubs, grow evergreen shrubs grow anywhere from two to three foot as a standard. And then by within a three-year period, they can be eight to ten feet tall, and that would be more than that would be pretty effective uh, in terms of that. And then, you know, that provides him with protection from the the idea of uh, allowing um, doing something to mitigate the screening, and then it provides a resident and protection in, in theory of hopefully trying to do what it can to mitigate the uh, noise level. I like the sound of that. Yeah. Real good. Tumble, what do you think about the? wall or fence material issues. I think that we're, we're, we're heading in the right direction. I think that the uh, Avravite is as a better sound absorber than a masonry wall. Uh, it's a lot more pleasing to the eye, that's for sure. Well, it would have to be in addition to either a fence or wall. Right. Right. I'd like I would like to see the continuation if we're going to go north south and uh, and and then join up with the east west side of the track. Uh, I would be in favor of the same material so that we're not we don't have a masonry wall across the north south and then a vinyl or trex type wall on the east west. I think I would I would be in favor of the same material. I like your idea, Fred, with the treks and the greenery. I think that would look good from both sides and from both directions, east, west, and the north, south. I believe there is a trex that would be of a same, similar color that could match up with the existing fence. So that way it's, it's a slightly sturdier material, but, but, but compatible. If I might, sure. Mario, I'd just to offer you this. One of the fences that I looked at was uh, <clears throat> called EcoStone which is made by Simtech. It's another synthetic composite. Uh, and it, what's nice about it is it looks like a natural stone wall. Uh, it comes in a variety of colors. It, it has, um, you know, the same, if not better durability than, than actual Trex does. Uh, it, it's really nice looking stuff. So it, it's, it's something that I would put around my home if I were putting up a fence, so to speak. Uh, the Trex offerings tend to be a little bit bleak, uh, and these are warmer, friendlier looking barriers. So just something to consider. I, yeah, and I'm just using Trex as uh, as because that's technically a brand. What I would, what I think what we're referring to is a uh, high quality composite that's sturdier than vinyl. So I think that high quality composite, whether it's the uh, Eco brand you recommended, Fred, or another. Uh, we don't have to pay the Trex prices because there's a lot of <laughs> things on the market. But anyway, getting into the to the other ideas in terms of compatibility, I think that addresses it. And then um, uh, it would be up to the Planning Commission in terms of what elements they would like to see in terms of meeting, in their opinion, uh, compatibility with adjacent uses. And then um, well, I may just, I'm sorry, Fred, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I, I think possibly we need to uh, table action on the special land use because I would like to see uh, a little more detailed uh, site plan showing and giving us some samples of the type of material that, uh, Fred, you wanted to put on that wall or fence. And also uh, some documentation about the hours of op operation and the uh, oh, what was uh, lighting and the lighting yes yeah that was he has he has addressed those previously i think what he always need to do is put notes on the site plan because the site plan would be part of the approval and putting notes on them indicating his hours of operation notes on them with regards to all the questions fred that you have and any other planning commissioner might have so if it's possible to table this then to allow us to make some modifications uh, and be more compatible, perhaps since Mario, I think has a better idea of what the board's looking for, perhaps he can advise us. Uh, and you know, if we're the next meeting, if I'm not mistaken, is in December, 
perhaps by then we can have a nice revised site plan that addresses all these issues properly. Yeah, I think that would be an excellent idea. Uh, also, uh, we need a landscaping plan. There was no landscaping plan included with the, uh, the site plans. Uh, Understood, that would be included in December. Question. So, does everyone agree that uh, it would maybe be best to table this until the December meeting and then uh, come back with some more detail for us? Um, I don't, I wouldn't need that for myself, uh, but what I would uh, wonder about that brand name to Fred Conda, uh, what is the name of that brand again that looks like the stone? Uh, it's a, made by a company called SimTech. Uh, and here, for example, bear with me just a moment, sir. Uh, I'm going to send you a link. Okay. EcoStone Dark Brown. Um, so oh, it's sold the, at the, Home Depot. It's not well, a special. I, I, no, I pulled it up uh, so I could get a picture, quite honestly. That was the quickest way to get a picture. Well, I, I w I've been doing some remodeling, and I've been to Home Depot a lot lately, and I saw one of their displays on Middle Belt and Schoolcraft that had a, a fence that was simulated stone, and I thought it looked really good if it's the similar same material. Yeah, it, that's that's probably the SimTech that you saw. That's the most predominant uh, type of composite that's not Trex that looks good. Yeah, I thought it looked really good. It's not cheap, but I thought it looked really good. Um, to the rest of the board, uh, I was at the Home Depot on Middle Belt and Schoolcraft there, and they have an outdoor display that shows a stone uh, uh, a fence that appears to be stone. It looks very high quality and looks very durable. Well, we did the test track at Ford. Randy Walker was very instrumental in securing that Syntec. And we went all the way around the test track in Dearborn, which is, you're not familiar, that used to be the airstrip. So there's I'm very miles of that fence up. And it's holding up real nice. I look at it every day. It's been in for a number of years now. It's tough. It's durable. Um, it still looks. That's what the, That's discolored. what they're using there, huh? Okay. Yep. Yeah, Randy. Randy pushed that through before he he retired. <laughs> Might make a good option. <laughs> he'd be a good. He'd be a good source. Okay. Do we do we want to act on this tonight or table it until we can get things squared away? Um, I'd like. I'd like to act on it. Uh, it seems to me we need some notations on the site plan. And um, we need uh, to know if the parking is going to meet the qualifications of what the retail space is rather than what the square footage of empty dirt is going to be. And I think once we have that, uh, yeah, it'd be good to go. Well, that's probably true, but that's another thing that needs to be checked out before we make a decision, I think. So you'd like to table? Yes, I would. Uh, I can go along with that, too. I'd like to table, but I'd like to make sure that Mario has a really good understanding of exactly what we want so we don't drag this out for a couple months, you know? Sounds good. Yeah, I agree, Eric. It sounds like we want to make sure that the screening along Maplewood is of a site of a composite material that's compatible with the existing fence. And then also that the landscape plan is included that uh, has the, uh, the lighting type plan. of evergreen uh, elements that's going to provide an effective barrier at full growth. And then Fred has mentioned the lighting plan. Well, and whether lighting plan meaning that, you know, they would have normal lighting. Uh, maybe on the, on the adjacent to the building and in the parking yeah, lot, and then the, if you just want to the fact that they're not going to have additional lighting out there, and that they only operate during daylight hours. Right. right. 
But I think a review the, uh, on the parking is important too. Yeah. A number need, on that. We need to uh, work on the, the parking numbers to make sure that uh, we have adequate parking. Uh, I know the, uh, the lot on the south side of the building was designated as a dual purpose lot and that couldn't be used for the parking numbers because of it being dual purpose. You still I, want- I think that. it would depend on um, the type of use that's being, if it's intended to consistently be used for um, um, a racetrack, the, the, I believe he mentioned ash, on the site plan asphalt RC course, if that's like a consistent use, then yeah, that would probably make it hard to count all the parking. Um, but if he, depending on Fred's idea of how frequent he'd want to use it, maybe if it's just for special events, because we do allow special events on other parking lots for a, for a minimal amount of time. On how frequent. Can we look at the parking space upon the retail space rather than the overall square footage of the property and the uh, recreational dirt track? Well, we have to consider that it's an outdoor business because that's the classification that he wants to open under. We can, I think, modify the parking requirements under that designation based on the activities. I mean, there's there's a lot of difference between different outdoor businesses. I mean, if you have a, a business like this, it's not going to have the same density of people as a flea market or something of that nature. So right. I think we take consideration of the activity and the number of people that are going to be involved. And we can make modifications at that point. Oh, we're going to spend money on this day. Mama looks like she's been thinking. <laughs> yeah, no, <that's> uh, <laughs> no. Does somebody want to make a motion to uh, Table act action on this until we get the uh, oh. the back and the, the new site plan. Yeah, I'll make a motion to a uh, table pending uh, modification of the existing site plan uh, with the various items we've talked about and reviewed by Mario before it comes back to us. I'm getting all kinds of interference in here from something. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of noise someplace. Sounds Is like there, we have a rogue participant someplace. <laughs> Is there a... Uh, I'll second the motion. I'll second that motion, Mike's motion. Okay. Motion is made to table until we get more site plan details. Uh, Brian, you want to take the roll? Mr. Steenberg? Aye. Commissioner Turnbull? Aye. Commissioner Walls? Aye. Airperson May? Aye. Okay. Uh, shall we go over the site plan now to see if there's anything additional that needs to be addressed? Um, with regard to the site plan, I think we did go a lot of those related to special use. It was regard to parking, uh, the landscape plan, um, and in terms of uh, the lighting and how any lighting might be in the parking lot levels versus um, none as proposed in the uh, track area. Um, some other specifics, uh, just like to know if, if uh, there's any going to be any kind of revisions to the existing facade of the buildings. Uh, if none, then the elevations would just show the existing materials. Um, One minor variation, if I may. Do you think we ought to have a, a small amount of lighting on the outside of the building to illuminate the track when it's not in use, especially if we're going to put a six-foot wall with uh, greenery around it? Uh, shouldn't that area be uh, somewhat a little bit illuminated for public safety and police concerns? Because it's going to be kind of a dark area after we put a six foot uh, composite uh, fence around it with uh, greenery on the uh, 
east side? Well, there needs to be for the parking lot and probably for that track too. But okay. we don't want we want to be careful that that lighting doesn't extend over off sure. of the property. I th I think just enough so it gives some illumination there from the standpoint of public safety, but of yeah. course not in the uh, not in the neighbor's front window. I agree. Yep. Um, and then just some other details, the fact that um, he, he has addressed the elevation issues and the fact that it mostly will be three feet, but um, I do believe the engineer is going to want to take a look at the plan to make sure so that at that point in time, a grading plan might be necessary. Um, and then uh, the fact that uh, there's no sidewalk along the board right now, so it's going to have to be provided. Uh, somebody's got a lot of noise in the background, I think. A lot of noise. It's getting hard to continue. It's getting a little hard to hear. Yes. Okay, the other the other two things uh, in the site plan were the sidewalk along uh, Maplewood. That needs to be addressed. And uh, the dumpster enclosure. Another yeah. Another item that needs to be added to the site plan. So, is, is this type of business going to require a full dumpster, or are they going to be able to utilize uh, standard trash pickup with a couple of garbage cans? It's up to the applicant. Uh, there was just a, I believe there was a trash enclosure shown. Uh, on, a, on, the, on the site plan. So if, if the trash enclosure is going to be constructed, we would just need elevations to show what kind of material is being used. But if they choose to eliminate the enclosure, you can just have a note indicating that uh, roll, rolling trash cans will be utilized. Um, with the cost involved in the type of business, I would question the necessity of an enclosure. Of course, when it was a lumber yard, uh, that was an absolute necessity. Um, but for this type of business, for uh, the amount of retail and the outdoor recreation area, I can't, I can't see where you'd need a dumpster enclosure. I think that that's unnecessary for this. Anybody well, see some reason why the applicant to decide whether he needs it or not, I think. If he's going to have a dumpster, he needs an enclosure. If he doesn't sure. need a dumpster, then he can do without it. But that he needs to uh, make a determination there. Well, to Fred Kanda, uh, talk with Mario and see if your business is going to require a dumpster. And if not, work that out in the site plan that you resubmit to us uh, next time we talk. Because for a hobby shop and uh, outdoor recreation area like this, I can't see why you'd need a dumpster. Are you still online with us, Fred Kanda? Okay. Uh, if not... Well, Mario, I'm sure you'll be you, in touch with him. you can discuss that with him. Yeah, bring uh, that up and take a look and see if the both of you believe a, a, a dumpster would be required. If it is, of course, we need a dumpster enclosure uh, following all the specs that we've used previously. But frankly, I can't see where you'd need a dumpster. So work that out with them, would you, Mario, on the next yep. site plan revision? Yep, absolutely. You know what? I, I, I apologize. I thought I was speaking and I wasn't. Uh, what I was going to say is that my intention is to retain uh, my old building to use for e-commerce and shipping uh, to try to uh, keep the traffic, you know, of uh, any sort of deliveries to that location to a minimum. And if we needed to dispose of anything larger volume, we have a dumpster enclosure and a dumpster at the other property. So it would be very easy for us to dispose of things there. Quite honestly, if the dumpster is not uh, needed by ordinance, then I would prefer to eliminate it. Talk with, yeah, talk with Mario uh, before we get your next site plan back. 
and take a look and, and see what you determine uh, usage wise. And if you're going to generate enough trash for a dumpster, by all means, we need a dumpster enclosure. But for what I see proposed here, I don't see you generating that much uh, trash and the city provides uh, the city's trash haulers provide flip top uh, garbage cans that most of us use and that may or may not be sufficient for your business. Work that out with Mario. It's not an yeah, automatic thing. So. Okay. Uh, the previous uh, motion to table was for the uh, special land use. You need another one for the uh, site plan as well? I'll make a motion. Go ahead. Make a, make a motion to uh, table and bring this back in conjunction with the special use. I'll second that. Motion made and supported. Comment? Take a roll, please. Oh. You're muted, Brian. Commissioner Steenberg? Aye. Commissioner Walls? Aye. Commissioner Turnbull? Aye. Chairperson May. Aye. Okay, well, thank you, Fred. And uh, I'm sure you'll be in touch with Mario to uh, present him with the new uh, information. Yes, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next item of business. Uh, request for site plan approval to establish a medical marijuana facility at uh, 5848 Hubbard in the M1 Light Industrial District. Uh, Mr. Ortega? Yes. Um, so this use um, does have some history behind it. Uh, however, um, well, we're, First, let me just go back over a second, just to make sure everyone's aware of it. So this location uh, is, is a two acre parcel. It's on the east side of Hubbard and it's uh, north of Industrial Drive, south of Park Lane on the east side of uh, Hubbard Street. Uh, right now it's occupied uh, the half of the site that is fronting on uh, Hubbard Street is a 16,800 square foot building. And the rear half is a, a vacant property. Um, the proposed use is by, it was originally by uh, an LLC called DSL Holdings um, to uh, operate a, uh, a uh, CF, uh, excuse me, a, a Class C grow, medical marijuana grow operation, a medical marijuana processing facility, and a provisioning center on the site. Um, these uses are special use in the M1 and um, the site has previously been approved. It was originally approved, uh, I believe it was in 2011, uh, for a caregiver grow a caregiver operation under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, and it was proceeding under that even after we revised our zoning ordinance, and so it was proceeding as a legally non-conforming uh, use. Um, although it did have the special use approval. So technically the special use approval for the caregiver can, uh, they could operate under that. However, the applicant is interested, as I mentioned, in still shifting from strictly operating as a, as a caregiver to the, uh, under the, M the Michigan Medical Marijuana uh, Facilities Licensing Act to create the commercial operation. Um, so originally the applicant came forward with this request back last year in November, 2009, a public hearing was held and we did discuss uh, the facility uh, with regards to all our special use requirements. So the applicant is back in front of us uh, to consider um, a, a uh, site plan that's addressing some of the additional issues. Um, so specifically with regard to medical marijuana, uh, the first issue uh, is regard to wastewater. Um, you know, the, these facilities, depending on the, the level and volume, will, will um, have their own processes, half, mainly regulated by the state, but they will have uh, potentially impact the uh, public wastewater or stormwater systems. 
So part of a special use requirement is to make sure that the uh, prior to the issuance of any building permit, uh, their proposed wastewater uh, plan is reviewed by the city engineer. Either the city engineer or another expert uh, in this uh, field of study, excuse me, field of uh, use to uh, determine to make sure there's no uh, negative impact on the wastewater discharge. Um, the applicant originally uh, identified the wastewater treatment plan uh, verbally in their uh, application. However, they would need to um, get with our engineer basically uh, to make sure that the, uh, all the wastewater issues are addressed. Uh, similarly with odor, uh, in this revised plan on sheet A2, they include a graphic that, and notes regarding a proposed carbon filters. Um, the effectiveness, uh, you know, is, is, this is a new industry. So the, the effectiveness of this is, um, can be, uh, I'll have a lot of different uh, alternatives. Uh, for example, the reason I mentioned this is because one of our original plans we looked at had a very extensive, very elaborate uh, air handling system that was intended to do to uh, hand, to deal with the odor. Um, in this particular case, they have a very modest graphic in my in my opinion, but I'm not an expert. So in the end, we would need uh, the building official working in concert with experts to determine if the carbon filters proposed is adequate, um, because uh, the intent of our ordinance specifically is to make sure that no odor can be detected outside of the building. So it's not a matter of property lines or anything to that effect. Our ordinance requires that no odor uh, can be detected outside the building. So the, a review of the uh, odor handling system is going to be a pro a very important. Um, other things that uh, the applicant did attempt to address, see they, the site plan in front of you and the floor plan does have the separate um, locations in the building for uh, the growing facilities, three separate grow rooms. Uh, the processing area, and then the provisioning center located in the south elevation of the building. Um, so it appears the, this floor plan would comply with uh, this separation standard. However, um, LARA and the MRA, the me 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 excuse me, Medica, Marijuana Regulatory Agency, is the one that eventually determines uh, that this site would be um, compatible with state statute. So that would be... Uh, uh, dealt with by having making sure that any approval is contingent upon the applicant submitting their final approvals from the state for the uh, floor floor plan. Um, similar issue with the security, uh, the security plan as proposed, the sheet A2 does have a location of cameras. We'd recommend the police chief looking at that location to make sure that they're uh, appropriate. However, the state has a, has a very detailed uh, review process after installation for, to make sure the cameras are adequate. And so any approval should be contingent on uh, state verifying that the security in the, in the site is accurate. Um, and then once again, the alarm system is directly tied into the security plan. So that would be another uh, similar to that. Um, I already mentioned a couple of times though, uh, in addition to um, the final site plan, the applicant, the review process is for the applicants to uh, have preliminary approval uh, from the state before they go and attend, uh, speak to local municipalities. Um, so having that, I spoke to the um, applicants after uh, this, this uh, review letter was handed out and they did provide me with a copy of their um, uh, preliminary approval. Uh, forgive me, I wasn't. I was supposed to get that to all of you prior to the meeting. I didn't have a chance to do that, so I might try and email that now. But they did forward to me uh, their uh, local approvals. Um, excuse me, their preliminary approval from the state with regards to pre-qualifications for the applicant. So they have already gone through and received their preliminary approvals from the state. Um, Moving on specifically with the, with the special land use standards, the access record uh, just can be met, uh, once again provided the applicant keeps uh, access records on the site, that would be something that could be noted on the site plan. Um, similarly with inspections, we were just, uh, while always standard, we would like to have a written, uh, written uh, acknowledgement from the applicant that they agree to allow for any necessary inspections with appropriate notification uh, 
for the site. And then also similarly, um, the city has the ability to suspend or revoke any special land use based on a finding that the facility is in violation of the provisions of the special land use. Um, so we would like a written acknowledgement from the applicant indicating they are aware that this could be revoked or suspended if there's any violation um, of our special land use standards or of standards um, by the state, uh, excuse me, compliance with state statute. Um, so those are all very specific with regard to, this, to the special land use because that's wrapped in the site plan. Um, getting into the site plan requirements. Um, Before we do that. Yes. Didn't we already approve this contingent on all these things being taken care of back in November of last year? Correct. And so, so uh, that's true. So this uh, before I mentioned the all these special land use issues because I believe any site plan approval that you would grant should be contingent upon these specific uh, special land use additional reviews because they've um, addressed some of them. There were some other contingencies as part of your original review that they have addressed and they, they've, uh, but there are some others that still need to be taken care of. So that's why I mentioned all those other ones right now. Okay. So there's kind of a laundry list at the end of the, this, this review. Um, but getting into site plan issues then specifically, one thing we noted is that uh, in the past, as I mentioned in the beginning, half the site is uh, a vacant land area. Originally it was used for outdoor storage uh, the applicant has fenced it off. They've uh, used the screen for it. And I believe last time I drove past the site, it was relatively clear, but I believe there's still some outdoor storage items there. Uh, that was a month ago. I think the applicant indicated they would be um, um, cleaning up the rest of that site. So any approval should be contingent, I believe, on cleaning up the rest of that site of outdoor storage. Um, with regard to planning, with the regard to the site plan issues, other site plan standard issues, the building complies with all our setbacks. Um, the applicant is proposing to uh, infill certain doors and windows, and they'll be matching them with traditional CM, the similar products that are already there. Um, so it's an it's an industrial building, so it's relatively standard industrial building. It's not anything attractive. Uh, they are attempting to add some additional landscaping that might help, but is it is a standard building for industrial. Um, with regards to parking, uh, on page four, I have the parking table, uh, provides all the requirements for the different types of uses. Uh, 38 or spaces are required and 40 have been provided. So they meet their setback, their parking standard. Um, one thing we would just mention is that they could provide uh, one way and do not enter signage uh, for the one way circulation. And then the applicant has addressed uh, the landscaping uh, minimum standards uh, with this um, revised landscaping shown on there. Final thing would be that they, they know uh, they have provided a um, photometric plan and they have provided certain light fixtures. One thing we notice this barn guard fixture has a light element that would appear to um, have the potential to be located below the uh, um, opaque uh, horizontal plane of the fixture. It's a very specific, uh, a very esoteric requirement, but at the same time, that light is below the the um, housing, and in the and in this in the in the lens, it's going to throw a lot of glare, and we're trying to get away from that on all our light on our, all our new buildings. So we would like that to see that uh, particular light fixture eliminated. So in the end, uh, the applicant has addressed a lot of the issues from uh, the original uh, special use, use with conditions granted last year. So we would recommend granting site plan approval contingent upon the eight issues uh, at the bottom of page five of uh, my review letter. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, does anyone have any questions or comments? Nope, none here. Fred, no. um, I got a hand. Would you want me to bring in the applicant to the panel? Yeah, if he'd like to make a statement. Okay. Bring in.
Yes, sir. Can you hear us? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Did, would you like to make a statement about your application? Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Craig Aronoff. I'm an attorney with Aronoff Law, and I represent uh, DSL Holdings as well as the land owning company LSD Real Estate and the uh, partner in the project uh, Gleason as it relates to the build out. Um, I have with me available, if we have extra questions, the architect John Guma, who uh, prepared the drawings for us, as well as James Hayes. He's our project uh, director from Gleason, CE Gleason Contractors. Um, our project is actually owned by a principal of the construction company as well. And so um, we're going to have their full attention from A to Z as we go through this process. So please understand DSL is, uh, you know, a company that has a lot of um, ability to really move forward. Um, we've effectively reorganized it over the past 10 months. COVID obviously caused problems that slowed a lot of different things down, but ultimately we put into position uh, a whole new team to move this um, project forward. And we very much look forward to getting it um, completed as promptly as we can. With respect to um, the special land use conditions, first that Mario has been wonderful to work with. Uh, again, it's good to see you, Mario. We've uh, we had the pleasure of working last year and then kind of revisiting it now. Um, obviously, the site plan uh, items all kind of meet your your ordinance, and it's really these other extra items as they relate to what I would call the MRA or regulatory requirements. Um, just by way of brief background, I'm sorry. Oh. Um, by way of beef background, just so you can know who I am, uh, I, my law practice specializes in the cannabis industry. I've been involved um, as a cannabis lawyer going back through the MMMA, the early caregiver law, you know, that was enacted in 2009 and been heavily involved in the um, evolution of the market from the 2016 Act, the 2018 Act and, uh, until now. Our firm has been responsible for getting, um, you know, a, couple hundred different people pre qualified as well as uh, having dozens of licenses issued from the Indiana border, the Ohio border, all the way to the Wisconsin border in the UP and, and everywhere in between. And so we take a lot of pride in making sure that what we're submitting is going to be approved um, with the state of Michigan and invariably because it already has a certificate of occupancy or conditional use approval the way we're going to be seeking as we go through your process. Um, in that vein, the, the one little caveat that I want to make sure um, as we go through it is going to be the whether or not a certificate of occupancy can issue before the state license is approved. The process for, requires us to have a certificate of occupancy to make application for the facility. So Mario, we'll work together so we get our linguistics correct, but really what we'd likely are gonna need somewhere along the way is this uh, temporary certificate of occupancy that will allow us to at least engage it forward. And then the approval from the state license would be conditioned on this, you know, the city issuing its business permit at the end of it or whatnot. Um, as we talk about wastewater and everything, please understand that one of the challenges we've had is the evolution of this uh, market has occurred is just working between dirt growers and hydroponic growers where we have, you know, enclosed loop systems where there may not be any water runoff or alternatively minimal runoff through a dirt system. And we're just finalizing exactly which project we want to go with. It's built to handle both. So we have, um, as you see from the plans that John has submitted, um, the flower rooms and everything have tables on them. And what we put on them is going to dictate how much water runoff. And these are those final decisions that we'll be putting in as we're putting together the actual grow plan, not just the build out of the room itself. Well, we'll work with the city engineers, of course, showing exactly what we're doing and make sure that we comply with all requirements as it's required under number one of the special use requirements. Um, odor is very similar. And the one um, thing I may take a little bit issue with Mario's presentation was the idea that it's new. Um, cannabis has been grown in California since 1996. It's been in Colorado for a little over 10 years now. Um, these commercial facilities have had a long history of innovation that carbon filtration and other air filtration models, um, negative pressure facilities and whatnot, have really kind of gone much more advanced. Um, in some, you know, back in 1990s, or I'm sorry, 2016, I was in California at a, at a show that was put on in Oakland, and I felt like Michigan was at kindergarten while I was standing in college. 
And here we are a few years later and we're well into high school and getting into college, right? We've advanced, we have a hundred million dollar market in Michigan per month right now. We did $110 million in August. I look forward to seeing what September did in gross sales. And what I mean by that is air filtration, odor filtration are things we become more and more expert with. And it's our intention to meet and ensure that we meet all the demands of your ordinance locally but just know that this technology is readily available and going to be invested in by this company. As far as the separation of actions go um, and activities, um, very specifically, uh, the law requires us to have separate entrances and exits for co-located facilities. There's very specific rules and very specific guidance through the Bureau of Fire Service, as well as the Marijuana Regulatory Agency. And our plans that John has already been submitted and gotten a few, uh, I would say, you know, several facilities of his own um, approved from his stamp drawings. And so we know hiring him and bringing him in and have the experience to ensure that what he's drawing is going to be approved by the regulatory agencies and of course comply with your local ordinances. Um, moving on to the security plan, very similar and alarm systems. Again, these are items that are mandated by the state. We take it very seriously and every level of what we'll be providing in this facility will meet or exceed your standards locally. Um, as they have, you know, throughout many, many municipalities throughout the state. Um, the, the idea of the cameras and what you're seeing on that system, again, is something that John is very keen on knowing what the state is requiring of us. Um, but certainly camera coverage of the entire facility at one point at the end of it, the state is going to have its agents walk through and they follow each other. While one sits at the panel, the other one walks through the facility and they never lose sight of them. Um, it is really quite amazing. And this is the technology that is, you know, already in existence and it's not, it's just being refined for, um, you know, for Michigan's use has already been perfected in other places. Um, as far as the route licensing and the local licensing, again, that'll go towards what's the timing of a certificate of occupancy relative to the ability to submit a phase two application. And from our experience, I can tell you that the MRA won't look at the phase two until they have already the certificate of occupancy they won't fully finalize it they'll give us some plan reviews they'll give us some you know thumbs up on our plans as we're intending to do but ultimately we have to know we built it to code correctly locally before we're able to actually submit the application for a license so we'll work out the details of the timing so that it fits what your um what your municipality is requiring of us but the language may have to just work that out. Um, access records and, and, and inspections are readily available. Those again are going to be regulated by the agency um, as well as what we'll do locally and certainly your um, inspection staff would always have the you know ability to contact the team and come in at any time. Um, and then as far as the um, acknowledging it, and this is a clarification that I hope you can give me, Mario, real quick. You were saying that you wanted it listed on the site plan. Are you looking to have there be, like John, add it as a box on one of the pages within the site plan itself? Or do you have like a three, you know, attestations that we can have, you know, the, the principal sign? making this acknowledgement. At worst, our office can prepare them and hand them to you. So one way or the other, we'll get all three of those done. You tell us the method you want, we'll deliver it in that fashion. Um, I think I addressed the eight questions. I spoke for a few, so I wanna kick it back if you have questions on it. I don't think there's much to address in the site plan um, uh, as I think we've kind of met or exceeded all of the different requirements that are within it, but certainly those can be addressed in the, in the questions as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, my only question was on the elevations. I mean, you're, you're changing uh, the, the side of the building somewhat by filling in a lot of the windows and doors. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you using the same brick to do that as is, is existing on the building? Yeah, our, our, the intention would be is to, to make it a nice looking building. It, this is you know, going from being an industrial building, it's currently masonry. Um, and, and it's a, it's an older, like, um, modulated building as it was built. Um, the Mason company that's been there, been there for, I think, two generations now. Um, and you know, it, it kind of has some, it looks like it was put together in phases. Our goal is to clean it all up. Um, it's going to be a place that's inviting. It is going to be customer facing rather than just being more industrial of use. So we are, you know, we are asking the public to come there 
And I think given the amount of investment about to be made into this facility, they're going to be pr producing something that they're going to be very proud to have people come and see. And they're not going to do that in a way that leaves, you know, walls that aren't really kind of aligned. Um, if I just remind you that the Gleason company, which, you know, have been responsible for building LA fitnesses and a number of other um, large commercial developments that you've probably seen throughout your driving through the metro area. This company does business in a number of states. They're phenomenal at what they do, and they're not going to let themselves be embarrassed by the project either. <laughs> I can say that very confidently that they're going to be very proud to be able to show this off as a, a flagship type of thing for their company to do more of these facilities. So um, in that vein, I, I think we can show you the, the renderings as we get, you know, more in the final touches and stuff like that. But the goal is to make it something that we're real proud to have people come and visit. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, my question would be to uh, Mario. Do you see anything that's uh, deficient or near deficient at this time that we would need to address? Uh, no, nothing else that was just in my letter. Um, I, like I said, I think a lot of this, I do recommend a site plan approval. Uh, however, you know, in our past uh, medical marijuana facilities, you wanted to see everything uh, completed. However, I think everything that is outstanding tonight is what we would deal with with normal site plans. You would normally grant approval contingent upon them uh, getting uh, police chief sign off. Well, not always police chief, but you know, engineer sign off. Um, right building officials sign off on that particular issue. Uh, the city engineer, I think I already mentioned. And then um, minor things like if they could just choose a different light fixture, I think that would be fine. Um, and then uh, the attestations that Craig just mentioned, I think that would work either way. If there's something that we, we don't have any standard ones right now, Craig, um, because we only have three uses. So this is only the second uh, commercial facility that's gone through this process. So. Um, that would be something that we could work with you to, to get, but it would just be to make sure that the language is in compliance with our standards, which is pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. So I don't really see anything, um, Mike, to answer your question with regards to um, any other massive outstanding issues. Um, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm good, Fred. Okay, uh, Eric and Eric. <laughs> I, I'm good to go on this one. Okay, well, we uh, we need a motion, I believe, contingent on the uh, completion of the recommendations listed in uh, this report. I believe we can uh, have it uh, taken care of administratively. I agree. If someone cares to make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. This is um, like catch up. Yeah. I'll second. Mm -hmm. good. Uh, Getting a lot of feedback. Yeah, I am too. Catch up now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, if there's no further comments, um, Brian, should you take the roll? Mr. Walls. Well, before Bye. you do that, why don't Read back our motion for us. Yep. So this is a motion to grant site plan approval contingent upon items one through eight in McKenna letter being addressed administratively. Okay. McKenna's letter dated October 1st, 2020. All right. Because we've had a lot of letters, so we want to make sure we have the most recent. All right. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. All right, so Commissioner Walls. I didn't hear you, Eric. Aye. Still didn't hear you. Okay. Aye. Okay. Commissioner Steenberg. Aye. Commissioner Turnbull. Aye. Chairperson May. Aye. <clears throat> Start off, uh, your conditional approval is granted, and you can work with uh, Mario to get things straightened out. We, we will do that. Thank you, everybody. Very much appreciate your time and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Next item uh, zoning ordinance amendment.
Public hearing on proposed amendment language regarding medical marijuana caregivers, grow operations, and two amendments and shared parking standards. Do we have anyone in the audience that wishes to? Well, before we do that, um, I we should go to uh, Mario's report. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, thank you, Fred. Uh, yeah, you have before you tonight the public hearing on this uh, issue we've been working on, which is for those in the audience that don't know, we were the the Supreme Court has allowed has reaffirmed finally the city's uh, zoning authority to regulate uh, the location of caregiver caregiver grow operations. So this uh, amendment would um, state that caregiver grow care caregivers that are growing more than the twelve plants that they're allowed would have to be located in a particular location. In this case, it'd have to be located in the M1 district. Um, and they would have to be located uh, 300 feet from any residentially zoned property and 500 feet from any school. Um, these are similar to what our uh, commercial facilities are, are required. In addition, they would have to address the wastewater, the odor and security issues that uh, the commercial facilities have to address. And they would have to get site plan approval. Uh, so it's not a special use, it's just site plan approval through us. And then um, with regards to, to that issue, um, and then they would also have to abide by all state and local uh, requirements, meaning they would have to at most have 72 plants on site for their caregivers. Um, and so it's just mainly um, the first step in uh, indicating that these uh, caregivers would be located in um, uh, the one locate one district in the city rather than being allowed in any district they would be allowed only in the uh, resident uh, the m1 industrial district should i go on to the other uh, uh amendment fred or well, you want to yeah, tackle this I one first a, i have a question on uh on the proposed language it's a little different than i what i thought we had agreed on and the uh part that uh, i'm looking at is uh H1. I thought we had agreed that we would say any site used by a licensed medical marijuana caregiver to grow more than 12 marijuana plants for a qualifying patient and then on from that. But you've added language above that which seems to change that so that they can't, they can only grow it for themselves and not for qualifying patients. Hmm. I was intending to try and say in that, that line above that just that if the medical marijuana primary caregiver is growing just 12 plants for themselves, then they don't have to comply with any of these issues. It's only when, because yeah, the paragraph I above. This discussion was that they were allowed to grow 12 plants for their use or for their patients use if they're a licensed caregiver. Oh, I see. You're saying you like if they're growing 12 plants and they just uh, want to use those 12 plants to service their patients, then they don't necessarily need to go through that. Yeah, so it yeah, doesn't have to if they oh, okay. if they only need 12 plants. Okay. So then I would think uh, we because would just have to strike for themselves in that language above. So it would say licensed medical marijuana primary caregivers growing 12 or, 12 or less plants in compliance with the requirements of the MRTMA and all people ordinances shall not comply, shall not be required to comply with the following standards. Yeah, so so that, if, we, if we did that, I think it would take care of it. Yeah, no, that's a good catch. Yes, yeah, we just strike the four themselves and then they can do that. Okay. And the other uh, two items we uh, we agreed to A and B and uh, struck the C and D. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. I'm good there.
So would you like me to go on to the other issue or would you like to see if there's any public comments on this particular ordinance first? Yeah, let's uh, do the marijuana ordinance amendment first and then uh, we'll take the second one. Are there any public comments, Brian? You're muted. Let me unmute myself here. All right. No, I don't see any hands right now. Back in the attendees. I see no hands up. Okay. Well, we can uh, close this portion of the public hearing and go on to the next portion for the shared parking. Mario? Yes. So this next amendment would uh, clean up some language beginning in uh, section zero, point zero six six, to uh, just streamline some of this with regard to the parking standards and, and to allowing for um, commercial operations and actually even uh, uh, multifamily sites to have shared parking, uh, uh, providing off street parking on other property than what their use is currently located. Um, and then getting into the specifics of how we calculate that shared parking, uh, the revised paragraph H utilizes a common method in, in zoning ordinances found throughout the state to uh, calculate a lower requirement for mixed uses, uh, excuse me, for shared parking based on the type of use and their hours of operation. So the table uh, then here is utilized to basically allocate a certain percentage of parking for each type of use based on their hours of operation to try and uh, provide factor in real world uh, situations for the simple fact that the offices are open nine to five. If a restaurant is open later, they need the parking later on in the day. So this, this table has been relatively effective in uh, allowing users uh, to, full, to more uh, fully utilize their parking. Okay. Uh, Brian, do we have anyone that wishes to comment? Um, any comments for shared parking? I'm not seeing any hands at the moment. I'll just give them a couple of seconds to see. I'm not seeing any hands still. Okay. Well, I think we can uh, close the public hearing then for uh, the two uh, ordinance amendments. Uh, were there any written communications? Uh, my office did not receive any written communications. Okay. Thank you. Planning Commission discussion. Uh, any um, more discussion on uh, either of these two amendments? Uh, no. Eric, you and Mike are both muted. I can't hear you. No, I'm pretty good with it, Fred. Okay, good. Mike, how about you? You're muted. I can't hear you. Uh, there you're back. Go. We can hear you. Uh, okay. Okay. I, I'm um, I'm good, Fred. Okay, fine. Well, let's uh, take them separately and have we need to have a motion to uh, recommend approval. for approval with conditions to the city council. Uh, right. the only, we made a change in the language of the marijuana section, so I would include that change. Recommend approval to the council with a noted change. Under marijuana. Okay, is there support? I'll support. Motion's made and seconded to uh, 
recommend approval of the marijuana amendment with the noted change. Um, Brian, you want to take the roll? Commissioner Turnbull? Aye. Commissioner Walls? Aye. Commissioner Steenberg? Aye. Chairperson May? Aye. Okay, moving on to the uh, chair parking amendment. We need a uh, motion to uh, recommend approval. <laughs> Uh, make a motion to approve. Second. Motions made and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? None. Uh, why don't you take the roll, please? Commissioner Walls. Aye. Commissioner Steenberg. Aye. Commissioner Turnbull. Aye. Chairperson May. Aye. Okay, both motions passed to uh, recommend approval to the City Council. Uh, next item is uh, discussion of revised language uh, regarding residential design standards. And I would ask that we uh, table this for next meeting. Due to the fact that it's going on 9 o'clock, we could easily go another half hour, 40 minutes on this alone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll ready? second. <laughs> okay. Uh, the. Uh, do you have any comments regarding planning and zoning matters? Uh, Commissioner Steinberg. Hey, Fred, do you just want to uh, just do a, a vote to the table just to make it official to table okay. at the next meeting? Somebody want to vote to table? Yes. The discussion? So, yeah, I have, I have moved by Steinberg, seconded by Turnbull. Okay. Commissioner okay. Steinberg? Roll. Aye. Commissioner Turnbull? Aye. Commissioner Walls? Aye. Chairperson May? Aye. Do commissioners have comments regarding uh, planning and zoning matters? Anything uh, new on the forefront, Mario? Um, not really. I mean, I always get discussion about different sites. Um, I'm trying to think of anything that's very up and coming oh i would i would like to ask you guys one question because i gotta do I, I think is a kind of a doozy one today someone came in uh talking about they didn't come in they had called me on the phone a real estate agent they were talking about the um save on drugstore right at the northeast northwest corner of ford and middle belt uh, for andrews right next, yeah right next to the right next to the plaza yeah, they yep. were. They say they have a high-end um, restaurant chain uh, that has only a few places in California, but they were interested. They would say, "What were the chances of getting a drive-through on that site?" They would want to. Cut a, <laughs> they would want to cut a curb cut uh, on the west side of the building, and then uh, have people come in and out. He said, "Oh, it'd be only right turn in and right turn out." I'm like. You're going to need at least 40 feet to get two car. I mean, 35, 40, you know, and if you're going to have a turn around and not to mention the fact that the land behind them is owned by the city because they don't own the parking lot back there. Right. I told them that now the DDA is trying to combine all that into one public parking anyway. I told them it took 12 years to get McDonald's because that was against the idea of a downtown. Uh, with a drive through. Standards. Yeah, with a drive through. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I don't know. I told him it'd be very, very difficult, but I said, I don't make any decisions. You have to We go through the process. And I told him you should also try and get the DDA's opinion, because I'm sure the DDA will have a very big opinion about that. So, I just wanted to get your guys' opinion of what they think about putting a drive-through there. 
what could be a premier restaurant that's only in California? Jack in the Box, maybe? Drive through, right. Some kind of barbecue place. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, in conjunction with uh, the questions here, the bakery on Ford Road in Sheridan Square, um, I don't recall the name of it, Cheshire or something. Yeah. That has been a pending bakery for, I think, three years now. What's going on with that? You mean, is they it the one, know. and the one across from, uh, like, um, what is that, Tim Horton? Across from Arby's. Yeah, Adjacent. Tim Horton Arby's, yeah. Kitty Corner the over there. Building they to actually were, the building The building to the west would be Family Heating and Cooling. It's yeah. the very yeah. western edge of Sheridan Square. Yep. Um, believe it or not, that actually was operating for a while as a bakery. They had a very minimal storefront and they had a lot of baked goods going out the back uh, for other uh, sites. I understand they uh, hold. Yeah, basically. And actually to the best of my knowledge, they're either closed because of COVID temporarily or closed permanently. Because I last time I keep driving by it and they even have less level of activity now. And I thought the site was cleared out, but I'm not sure. But it was called Pebbles, Pebbles Bakery. And I believe yeah. that's no longer there. I'm not positive. They, they might were, come back after COVID, but. I believe they were operating improperly anyway because they're not supposed to be wholesaling there, are they? They were approved to have a storefront and I think what they had was pretty minimal and I don't think we kept them to any kind. I don't know if their approval included any kind of more rigid standards to make sure that people, customers that actually could walk in and get something. I don't know if they actually could or not. Um, but that, uh, I think it might have been one. It's don't kind of a wasted was. storefront in a good location yep. in yep. a popular shopping plaza. So if it's empty, if they're out of business, uh, I would hope that the DDA is promoting that site for future development because, right. as far as I know, it, it hasn't been operational since the sign pebbles went up or since they got approved. Uh, I've never seen any activity there. And I'd like to see some activity there. It's a, it looks like a prime retail spot. Yep. So I'd like to make some inquiries into that and see where that stands. Okay. That's all I have. Um, yeah, I don't have anything else really concrete. There's a lot, always a lot of rumors and I get, I'm not rumors, I get a lot of inquiries. Uh, but nothing that I can think is really concrete. Um, but yeah, I take it the opinion of the drive through uh, at the corner right there would be pretty hard pressed to get any kind of planning commission approval or depend on yeah, what they Yeah, I can't present. see that working there. Yeah. Well, I don't think we can turn it down carte blanche because we approved similar use right across the street. So well, they have no parking and they have no place for a drive through. I, I agree, Fred, but I mean, if somebody wants to pay their money and submit, I, I, I think it behooves us to take a look at it and no, see what no. they got in mind. But it's, it's going to be pretty I, difficult when you don't own the parking and you have such a minimal area. But if, if somebody wants to, how, how do they say in Vegas? Pay your money and take your chances. I, I don't think there's they tens come forward. The building, are there? I'm sorry. What was that, friend? I don't think there's ten feet between the buildings. Are there? No, there's no. It's a shaman. It's a shared wall. I think even. So they'd have to tear well, down the building. There is a walkway there, I believe. Oh, okay. But I don't think you could get a car through there. <laughs> no. Um. I think their biggest impediment might be getting a curb cut out of M dot because it's so close to middle though. Oh, I, think, yeah. I think the south side of the street was uh, relatively easier, similarly because I, there was one previously, I yeah, believe, they, right? They, yeah, there was one there and they didn't have to put a new one in. They just didn't take it, the old one out. Right. Yes. So that's it. Other than that, uh, my only issue would be to let you know that there are, next time you look at the zoning ordinance amendments, there'll be uh, quite a few more because we're going through cleaning up some other issues. Um, so that'll be your, uh, what I'm calling the winter 2020, 2021, I guess, uh, zoning amendments. 
Okay. That's Eric, it. do you have anything? No. <laughs> The, uh, I talked, Kim sent me a text. She said that uh, CVS sold six weeks ago and it's looking like they might be move, trying to move a furniture store in there. So I thought you guys might find that interesting. Yep. Hmm. Okay. They haven't talked to me yet, but, uh, but yeah, Kim had that info. Okay. So the plans for the um, banquet hall? Yeah, he's, I think uh, he was, between getting the engineering ready for that parking lot he was gonna to do to convert the uh, detention pond, that slowed him down and then COVID happened. And yeah, I think that kind of- uh, He gave up on it. Yeah. yeah. Well, a furniture store might be a better fit. <laughs> okay, okay uh, Brian? No, nothing. Mario, do you have anything else? Okay, well, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn then. Motion to adjourn. A second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion's carried. <laughs>